All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. And our next guest is Matthew Rothschild. He is, I think, editor of The Progressive. That's progressive.org. And I've got three important articles to direct your attention to, um, including a new one. But here is a Leahy concerned about NORTHCOM's new Army unit. That's from October 7th, 2008 at progressive.org. Uh, then there is, what is NORTHCOM up to? This is from November the 12th, 2008. And now the brand new one, the Pentagon advances on America, October 21, 2010. There may be more on this topic, but uh, those are three good ones for you. Welcome back to the show, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's always nice for you to have me on. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today. So um, I guess, first of all, take us back then to 2008. Uh, or in fact, maybe we need to take us back to 1998 when Bill Clinton created the Northern Command for the United States in the first place, or at least tried to, right? Well, uh, he may have tried to, but it was actually George W. who got the thing established on October 1st, 2002. So this is basically kind of like having AFRICOM and having CENTCOM. This is how the Pentagon divides the worlds into different uh, command responsibilities of battle space, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, before 9-11, I mean, the most common command was the U.S. Southern Command. I think that a lot of political people understood was the way the Pentagon uh, tried to intervene in Central America and South America through uh, Southcom, uh, which was in Panama for a long time. And then uh, there's the CENTCOM, or U.S. Central Command, which has uh, jurisdiction, Pentagon jurisdiction anyway, over the whole Middle East and Afghanistan, and it was Petraeus who was in charge of, of CENTCOM there uh, before he was sent over to replace McChrystal over in Afghanistan. And so now we have NORTHCOM, and, and, and that should strike people as odd because the Pentagon is not supposed to be uh, patrolling the streets or the skies of uh, the United States. I mean, we're, we have something called the Posse Comitatus Act, which has been on the books for more than 120 years, which says that the, the military cannot be involved in, in uh, law enforcement here in the United States. But after 9-11, um, Bush was able to push through this and establish the U.S. Northern Command. And one of the astonishing things, which is what uh, Leahy was concerned about, was uh, this idea that, uh, not an idea, it's actually a fact, that NORTHCOM has its own dedicated fighting force. It got the Army's 3rd Inf Infantry Division, 1st Brigade Combat Team, uh, 4,700 people who actually had experience fighting in Baghdad and patrolling Ramadi in, in Iraq, and now they're deputized to the U.S. Northern Command. This is this may be illegal, actually. Uh, it hasn't been challenged yet, but uh, the ACLU is worried about it. I'm worried about it. Senator Leahy's worried about it. Well, now, if I remember right from the Onion headline uh, back in 2003, George Bush bravely leads 3rd Infantry into battle in Iraq. Uh, I think they were the tip of the spear of the American invasion, the 3rd Infantry Division, yeah. right? Yeah, they were one of the, this one is of the like first. like the old not... Big Red One, the 1st Infantry from back before yeah they were they were right there at the front lines all right well now there's a few things to go over here first of all uh you talked about the posse comitatus act can you give us a little bit of history for people who don't speak latin and aren't too familiar with say 19th century american war history well, it was just it was uh, a law that was put on the books to keep uh, the army post Reconstruction era from uh, patrolling the streets, essentially, and uh, and that's been on the books for a long time. The Bush administration tried to uh, change it and actually did for a little bit, and then Leahy himself of Vermont was able to pass a law that would put or was supposed to put anyway uh, the military back into its box, but it seems to be jumping out of that box right now. And now I'm sitting here uh, scratching around inside my brain trying to come up with the name of the Supreme Court case, but I'm going to get it wrong, so maybe I'll just stay quiet on that. But at some point, I think right after the Civil War, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, martial law is unavailable as a power to be exercised by the executive as long as the courts are still open for business. And I think they were directly addressing uh, habeas corpus, but um, they were basically saying – well, like, for example, what happened to Jose Padilla, you can't do that. As long as the country is not in such a state of internal convulsion that the judges are still able to make it to the office in the morning, they have the priority. 
Well, I hope that's still the law of the land, but I have some doubts about that. I, one of the doubts is National Security Presidential Directive 51 that Bush signed uh, when he was in office that gives the President of the United States the, the power over all three branches of the government, not just the executive branch, but also Congress and the judiciary in times of an emergency that the President himself would declare. So there are a lot of things on the books that that uh, especially came on the books during Bush and Cheney's reign that are just sitting there waiting for uh, another chief executive who wants to, you know, haul them out and really destroy our democracy. And having NORTHCOM at the chief executive, the commander-in-chief's disposal, would be, uh, uh, you know, something that that president, if, if he or she is malicious and undemocratic, could use. Yeah, and you know what? My, uh, what I thought it was was actually right, the Milligan case. Uh, that was the Supreme Court decision where they said martial rule can never exist where the courts are open and then the proper and unobstructed exercise of their jurisdiction is also confined to the locality of actual war. So, um, but I guess then that's begging the question, isn't it? But here's my thing. Uh, you know, tea parties here and, and left wing, uh, eco activists there or something. Uh, what, internal threat is there don't tell me the mosque building muslims in new york are, are going to be the target of this which americans uh, could george bush or barack obama possibly conceive of using this third infantry division against matthew do you think yeah, I, I just don't know i mean that's that's the puzzle and that's the worry um you know there was uh Discussion in the Bush administration by Homeland Security. Actually, that contract went out to Halliburton to build uh, detention camps for for illegal immigrants or undocumented workers. Um, and so, and that's always a, a fear that I have that there are going to be uh, roundups if uh, you know this climate uh, gets any worse. I mean, we're seeing a lot of nastiness coming out of Arizona and spreading across the country about people who are here without proper papers. And, you know, you, you, it doesn't take a wild imagination to see that things could really go down an ugly slope here uh, in the United States. And then to have all that power at the hands of the president with the Northern Command at its disposal uh, is a concern. I mean, last year, the Northern Command tried to get Congress to allow it to dispatch 400,000 troops across the country in times of an emergency and to let the Secretary of Defense, not even the president, uh, authorize it at his or her own discretion. So, I mean, it, it's not like the Pentagon is uh, not thinking of these things. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's just like Robert Higgs wrote in his book Crisis and Leviathan. You have this ratchet effect where no matter how bad these people fail, since they have a monopoly on doing their supposed job, all they can ever do is get more power. So, if 9/11 sits there and happens or happens while they're sitting there on their watch, then they get a Patriot Act, they get an Office of Homeland Security, then the 9-11 the Commission comes out and says just what a poor job they did, they get a Department of Homeland Security out of that, then uh, Hurricane Katrina comes and drowns New Orleans, and George Bush says, you people are right, you know what, Brownie didn't do that good of the job, from now on we need to put the Army first, they're the ones that we can trust to really get things done, and every time something horrible happens, the rule of law dies a little more, and and the power of the imperial presidency grows, and not just over Iraqis and Afghans and Pakistanis and Somalis, but over us here. And this is what concerns me. And, and you know, any, any person in any branch of government and any bureaucracy is hostile to giving up power. Rather, they want to accumulate power. And now that power has been accumulated in the executive branch, you don't see Obama giving it up. And, and so it's just going to lie there waiting for the next person to abuse it, assuming that Obama doesn't abuse it. I don't think Obama will abuse it in, in any kind of dictatorial way, though I know there's these conspiracy people on the right think that's going to happen any second. Now, that doesn't, uh, that's not how I read Obama, but I do have some real concerns if, you know, if Sarah Palin became president. Sure. Well, and, you know, for the people who, uh, you know, come from the other point of view, think this is perfectly fine when it's George Bush or if it's Sarah Palin, but don't trust it with Obama, the point is the same. Right. That, you know, violence in this society is supposed to be distributed by law, not by the will of some man up there on a high chair. Absolutely. And where were they when Bush was grabbing all this power? Right. Well, and, you know, there is uh, there's plenty of real concern for the Constitution and plenty of hypocrisy on all sides to go around, it seems like to me. But uh, I'm really glad that the progressive is good on this issue. It's some of the best journalism on it. We'll be back with Matthew Rothschild after this. Anti-war radio.